are listening to On the Shoulders of Dwarves, a weekly podcast about role-playing games and role-playing gamers. On the Shoulders of Dwarves. Hello and welcome to another episode of On the Shoulders of Dwarves, a weekly podcast about role-playing games and the players who play them, also the game masters who play them, also storytellers and narrators, everyone who play role-playing games. My name is Ran Aviram. <laughs> My name is Uri Lifshitz. Hello! And we have a guest with us today. Guest, please introduce yourself. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the founder of the Indie RPG Pipeline, and I'm also currently running the Playmakers Awards uh, Kickstarter. Oh my, these sound very interesting, Richard. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> yes, please tell us, what, what is the Playmaker Award and what is also the Indie RPG Pipeline, which is, I think is a service that not enough people are aware of and they probably should be? Well, I, I can't possibly disagree with you on your own <laughs> podcast, uh, Iran. So the, the Playmaker Awards is something that I, I started in November last year, and they're really a, a, a way of saying... Of recognizing and, and saying thank you to the people um, not to great designers not to great uh, games masters or uh, even to players but to the people who actually create the space for people to play so it would be typically uh, convention organizers so so the people who do the admin and the scud work and uh, in order so that other people can can sit around a table and uh, and play and roll dice and and have a good time now this is usually the part of the job that if done right no one is aware that someone did it exactly yeah yeah you might get an email right at the beginning uh, from from this particular person telling you here is the uh, your schedule for mm-hmm. the uh, for the event but apart from that you may may never see them at all Uh, and that means they don't get, get the credit. So is this the reason you decided as, by the way, a playmaker yourself, we'll discuss a bit of your history in a moment, but is this why you decided to give them some, some of the limelight because they never get any attention? I, th- I think it is, it's partly that. And certainly the people I've spoken to, the, the people who've been in the community who've been supportive of it have said, this is a great idea because these people don't get enough recognition. But I think also it, it comes from a place of, of sadness and loss. Oh. And, the, the, and that is all wrapped up in, in 2018 and, and what happened in 2018. So a bunch of things obviously happened, but the, the most pertinent ones were around um, like the closure of, of the UK Role Plays Forum and the, uh, and the, the announcement of the sunsetting of, of Google+. Plus. I know a lot of people in uh, in the media in the wider web were like yeah, we didn't even realize G+ plus was still a thing but those two forums were my primary way of connecting with the role-playing hobby online mm. the 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 UK role players forum was where I kept in touch with everybody in the in the, in the scene in the UK and And the Google Plus was where I was tapped into that, that broader network of people across the world. And to lose both of them kind of in, in, in the same year, I mean, G Plus is still around, but it, it, it is a shadow of its former self, is it made me realize about how dependent or fragile oh. I, I was on these things. And, and that my, my, my connections to the hobby were, were, were disappearing. A... So I do a seminar at Dragon Meet every year, which is the, the What's Hot in Indie RPG seminar. And I do a, a little um, a handout for it. And I talk about what's happened in the year. And I talked about the end of UK role players and I talked about the end of G+. And I speculated about, okay, well, I don't know what's going to happen as a result. And I don't know what the online RPG presence is, is going to look like when all this shakes out. But what I did a reason was that the... The, the places where we actually still physically meet. So things like the conventions and the meetups and the clubs and the gaming groups that, I mean, these places have always been important, but they would become all the more important, especially for me, as we lose this, this huge uh, connection, connection point, this huge online meeting place, the physical, the meet space of meeting places were going to be all the more important. And that set me thinking about, well, the people who, Do the organizing who, who actually create these meeting places for us all to 
to like, keep in touch and to kind of make new acquaintances. And so that set me on the path thinking of like, well, well, what can I do to, to, to thank these people and to draw a bit more attention to how important uh, they are and, and how important they will be? I should note by now that I know Richard. I've, I've, we've known each other for quite some time now. And I think I first learned about you and met you in a context of organizing an indie role-playing game. Uh, and probably ever since then, again and again, in the same sort of context. And you are very much UK-oriented, as, as we've said before. And just so if the people at home that listen to us are not from the UK, Dragon Meat is the big London-based gaming convention and there uh, are many others we've actually talked quite a bit about them in the previous few episodes and actually i myself also was semi-dependent on uk role players i am not very much into any sort of community i think online but that's the only uk based one i've ever known and it is a shame that it's gone because there's nothing to replace it while with g plus where for some reason it became a huge place for role players online and not Facebook. And I, I'm not sure why. Maybe because of its connection to Hangouts, which allow you to role play online. Um, now that it's going away, I've seen many efforts of migrating entire communities into places like MeWe, uh, which is, it sounds really weird. I, I don't like saying MeWe. Uh, I don't think I'm going there anytime <laughs> soon. Um, but I really appreciate. Uh, both as an organizer myself, I use, mostly in Israel, I used to work, work, volunteer. Everyone, of course, is volunteer. Yes, of course, of course. Everything here is in, is in our hobbies about volunteering. I used to volunteer myself, and I'm very much appreciative of you being appreciative of this thing. I would like to know a bit more about the process. Uh, it's an award so how do you nominate people and how do you give the awards and what's going on? And also, who won? So let me take you through the process. I, I, I think the most important thing or the thing that I realized first was that I was not in a position to judge the level of contribution of all the different people who I would hope to be nominated. So uh, I had to adopt a, a a very different approach to what you might think of as a, as a standard award. The nominations were a lot more straightforward. So I said, "This is the uh, award I'm I'm trying to give. I'm announcing these Playmaker Awards. This is the kind of person who uh, who I want to who I I want to be recognised here." I could have said, "This is an award for con organisers," and and they were foremost in my mind, but. I didn't want to be limited by that. So I actually had to define it more uh, by exclusion. I had to say, listen, this is an award for people who create space for other people to play, but not designers, yes. not games masters, not players. Like, is it you can absolutely nominate those people, but not for their design work or their games master work, whatever, because I thought these... Uh, those people have their own ways of, of being recognized already. Yes. We have design yes. awards and we have, um, you know, thank your GM day and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I put out the nominations as, as well as I could with my, you know, rather pitiful social media uh, uh, footprint. I basically said, listen, if you, if you have taken the time to nominate somebody and, and, and it is a legitimate nomination, you know, is that you're actually putting someone forward for something they actually do then they're a winner. Then I, I, I'm certainly not going to say wow. like, oh, these uh, five people, they are the winners and the other 15 people who have done all these different things. No, no, they don't make the cut for some reason that I don't understand. So the basic thing was, you know, there was a, a prize that I gave to each one of them. It was like a, a drive through RPG. It was a $20 drive through RPG uh, voucher. Uh, I put out the nominations and then basically, but I knew kind of going into it was that, okay, well, I was going to, I was going to fund uh, as many people as were nominated. And uh, I could level set by essentially how many nominations were coming in, how much it was going to cost me and whether or not I needed to uh, push the nominations more or maybe uh, just say, okay, maybe just kind of cool it off a little bit. Happily, we, we didn't get to that point and I was able to, and everybody who was nominated before I before I closed the nominations, everybody who was nominated, I would say, yep, these are all absolutely legitimate people 
they're all winners as far as I'm concerned, if so long as they accept it, because I completely understand that if you were a person and you're going out at your business and then somebody just announces that you've won an award, you'd be like, okay, well, hang on, wait a minute, before you publicly associate me with this thing that I've never heard of, can you like tell me a little bit about myself? So, so before I actually announced any of the winners, I made sure to contact them and say, I've done this thing, you were nominated, this was the nomination, do you accept? And if they accepted, then I announced them as a winner. So that was the the basic process. It was very flat. And even though I was organizing it, I tried to take myself out of it as much as possible. Although you, you should be there. Uh, can you give us a bit of a history about your role in organizing role-playing games and, and role-playing games at all? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I got into uh, kind of modern role-playing games in uh, September 2011. So that was, it was uh, Concrete Cow. So I'd heard about Concrete Cow the day before, like the Friday evening, and on a whim, uh, pretty much took the train up to Milton Keynes and, and went there and figured that, um, you know, it says it starts at 10. So it'll be fine if I get there at like rock up at like 10.20. That's not, that's not a problem. Oh, oh, how wrong I was, because, of course, the game started at 10, like the muster happened at 930. And that meant that I was kind of rock- walking in there and, and saying, OK, well, it's quarter past quarter past 10. It's fine. And everybody already had a game. <laughs> and I was pretty much ready to turn around and go, this was just a big mistake, this whole role playing thing. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to work for me. I'm just getting on a train back to London because it was going to be like a five hour wait until the next game started. So like, I wasn't going to wait around, like hang around that long, uh, except for um, one guy who came along and I recognized him from his name badge. And I said, oh, you're the guy who's running the game I was, I'm interested in. And he was like, oh, oh, that's great, but we're full because it was a five-player game. It was a strictly five-player game. Like you couldn't have fewer, you couldn't have more because there were only five characters for it. Uh, and I said, oh, what a shame. And the organizer was there trying to work out, okay, what can I do with this noob, you know, who doesn't understand how uh, role-playing conventions work. Uh, and the guy who was running the game kind of gave up his seat for me. You know, he was oh. like, it was, it was a GMless game. And he said, okay, you take my character and I will step back and I will just facilitate the session and and really it all and it all kind of springs from there because the on the uh, on the way back uh, from that convention I met uh, a guy on the train and he told me about London Indie Meet and then November I went along to my first London Indie Meet and then uh, after going to London Indie Meet for a year I the the founder started uh, basically looking to kind of step down from his role and he started off by letting go of the Dragon Meat kind of games on demand. And there's a whole other story about how I basically ended up um, on my own <laughs> with five tables <laughs> and no GMs <laughs> on the morning of Dragon Meat. And how there was this little, what I call this little Dragon Meat miracle where suddenly GMs appeared from nowhere to, to help run games. Uh, and then when uh, ultimately the founder did kind of move on, is that they, I kind of ultimately took over... Uh, the the more administrative and the financial side of the group and then have then handed it on to other people. I say handed it on, but we are... Uh, London Indie Meet um, is, a, is an anarcho syndicate that's powered by the apocalypse. <laughs> so what that means is that if you, uh, you don't work out succession plans with people, uh, if you want to leave a role, you just leave. And then you say, I'm about to leave this role. And then you walk out. And then basically, if if somebody else wants to do it, then they take it. And if nobody wants to do it, then the, the group just uh, just fragments and disappears. Like life. So you've played uh, an indie game in Concrete Cow, which is, by the way, the, a name of a convention. Uh, if you guys didn't know, and there's no reason that any of you would ever know that unless you're from London, uh, I would never in my life would imagine that Concrete Cow is a name of a convention. But there is actually a Concrete Cow, so there's a reason for it. And na- then you've continued on to Indie Meet, which is, again, a meeting of indie games where you play indie games. And now you celebrate things with Indie RPG Pipeline, which we'll get to in a moment. What's your deal with indie gaming specifically? And have you ever played D&D? I've never played D&D. 
Uh, I've started, I came into role playing games from a completely different, through a completely different path. So I came in uh, from a theatrical background. So I have a background in theater and I was running, I started off as an actor and then became a director. And then I got bored with producing plays that were written already. And so I started doing devised work where we created the play with the actors as, as through the rehearsal process. And uh, I was essentially looking for uh, collaboration tools, so better collaboration tools, so that I could work, so that the actors could have a more equal say in how the in, in how the premise was developed. Because as I started off with the device pieces, it was essentially they would generate ideas and then I would say, yes, no, yes, yes, no, no. And I was doing a lot of the creative heavy lifting because I knew that if you just put a bunch of actors together with no direction – no they're all too polite to say like we should do my idea you know everything just kind of gets like there's just a lot of a lot of discussion and no production is you need somebody who is able to say no at different points in order that you end up you know ultimately with a play at the end of it uh and so i was essentially in that role of of doing a lot of the saying no at different points to make sure that, that the play was the play was produced and i wanted a better way of interacting uh, with with the actors so that they could build off each other's ideas and have a uh, a way a language that they could use where they could say no to each other without it being a tra- uh, a terrible emotional you know scene you know because you know they're actors and i thought that uh the collaborative game for the gmless game specifically might have and i was and i was and i was perfectly right in this that where you have game designers who are trying to uh, design a structure that mm. allowed a group of, of players to sit around a table and create a story together, that that same methodology, that those that, that same technology could also be transplanted back into, uh, into the theatrical world. So you have, um, so the actors could sit around and essentially play a game together, but create a story out of it. Well, first of all, this is one of the best how I got into role-playing stories I've ever heard, so kudos. And I'm assuming midway you did some experimental stuff with the improvisational theater, etc., right? Yeah, so what happened was that I did, I think, uh, four device pieces, and then I got bored of doing device work because it was too easy. <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> it sounds um it sounds uh, uh it sounds which sounds kind of uh, kind of arrogant but what i'd found was that i'd done a, a device piece that was a you know a light comedy i'd done one which was more serious i'd done one which was a really intense drama and uh, i'd done one which was almost uh, like science fiction you know so one that was uh one that was a kind of a speculative fiction about the future and it was like an anthology thing so I thought well I pushed a lot of these boundaries in terms of like the the the, the type of of play that I can create using the device piece but I was always aware of the fact that I was still standing in there as the creative agent because no matter what the actors did in their their rehearsals as they were creating the scenes essentially was the inspiration for me to go up and write the script and I used a lot of their lines, but equally I could create lines and so forth. So I was still the the creator and I loved it because it was a, a great collaboration, but I wanted to push it further and go, okay, well, can I use these structures and these mechanics that I'm getting from indie role-playing games to then create a full-length improvised show? And so that was the last show I kind of did in that series, one where essentially a bunch of actors got up each night and played a story game in front of an audience but the audience didn't realize they were playing a game together. <laughs> and so we did a we did a run where the actors created an entirely new play and it was a the elements of comedy but there were elements of drama, elements of romance and so forth. And it was an entirely new story every single night on their feet right in front of the audience with nobody knowing how this thing was going to end including myself. It was the most uh you know, kind of gripping time I've ever had as a theatrical director where I'm, I'm sitting there in the next to the technician going, how, how are they going to get out of this one? <laughs> how are they, <laughs> they going to end this play? <laughs> 
I, I sympathize as, as an improviser who who did this show and these shows and you know I sometimes find myself on stage or inside the gaming session going how the hell do we move forward from here uh, I would love to hear your take on some of the not so indie RPGs which are collaborative storytelling things like uh, fate accelerated for example which is very 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 mechanic light and how you see those fine lines of storytelling, collaborative creation, uh, theatrical elements meshing together. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't speak to Fate really. I've only I've only ever played one game of Fate, and it was it was run by uh, Lloyd Jan, um, mm-hmm. who is actually one of the Playmaker winners, uh, and he's uh, an amazing uh, player, an amazing uh, game runner, uh, and it was a it was a two player game which I kind of fell into kind of by accident because there was nothing else on offer. And uh, he, we had an amazing time with it. Um, it was basically like a, you know, like a He-Man episode. It was a Saturday morning special. Like he had his own scenario where, and his own, um, I don't know what they, I don't know what they're called in fate, but his own way of, 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 of bringing in those Saturday morning kind of cartoon tropes. And we were basically, it was called, we ended up naming it like Peril at Pegasus Peak. <laughs> which I think kind of wraps up <laughs> basically kind of epitomizes the kind of like the, the, the tone of the game it was basically like if you if you remember those like how you used to buy like He-Man and there was like a little comic in the in the pack with the He-Man figurine and then I would it was basically kind of like using those, those kind of tropes so I haven't I haven't really played much uh, so that was the only game of game of fate I've played so it, uh, I just gave it as a random example for one of those uh, system which is very heavily storytelling uh, oriented. However, it is no longer considered, uh, shall we say, indie. It's more of a mainstream thing nowadays. For those kind of for those kind of games, I think it's I think it's difficult to to take much from them into kind of directly into the theatrical arena um, because you you have to strip down so much in order to make something work in a in live in front of an audience with actors where you don't have a table and you can't retcon uh so you have i mean the the basis that i used for that final production was a, a story game that uh, that somebody else had brought that we'd kind of developed together is that they basically come along and i come along to a like a game jam and said i have this plan to do i have this idea of doing a story game about uh, about midsummer night's dream and I said, yes, I shall sign up for that. And what we ended up doing was some of the structure from which the road to Lindisfarne. And then he took it away and kind of developed it. And I took it away and developed it in a different way. And then we used that as a, as basically as a chassis for the, for the show. But it is what I would call a structured freeform, which is essentially where you have a complete liberty to define how you want things to go in any particular scene. And, and there are, there is nothing but the most basic mechanics in there. It is essentially, the game is essentially rather than, rather than an engine. It is the, it is the frame. It is the structure and it will take you from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, but it won't include things like um, resolution mechanics or counters or dice rolls or those kind of things. I think there's absolutely things that you can learn from role playing games, uh, from all sorts of different kind of role playing games that you can uh, that you can take and that you can adapt, but I think it, I think the more mechanical they are, the harder it is to just take it and drop it straight into a an, into a theater. Unless you are doing a a show, which is come and watch people play a role playing game, which is an oh, which yeah, is an yeah. entirely a different, different thing. thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We need to go on. So let us discuss a bit the indie RPG pipeline. What is it? So it's a blog where I post every new role-playing game that's being released or going into crowdfunding or looking for playtesters that is not a hardcore mainstream game. And when I say, uh, when I say mainstream in this sense, I mean... Uh, I'm really limiting it down to those few publishers that everybody would recognize. So anything produced by Wizards of the Coast, anything produced by FASA, anything produced by Chaosium, uh, anything produced by like Palladium, like Pelgrane, those people who are uh, 
who who everybody would go okay yeah they're a, they're like a mainstream publisher and then beyond that i i make no distinctions i'm i'm using indie in the pure uh, publication way so if you are a kind of a creator publisher and you're putting out your game i don't care what genre of game it is whether or not you consider it to be a narrativist game a story game whether or not you consider it osr whether you consider it a fancy heartbreaker then it is good for inclusion in in the indie pipeline as far as i'm concerned and 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 that's basically it i mean it is just a website where i basically post every single new game that is coming out and there's about 60 entries a month so this is obviously averaging out about two a day The most of them are new games. Some of them, the next, the next most are crowd new crowdfundings, and then the smallest number are probably uh, people looking for playtesting. But that I think is just because there is no one good site that I can plug into to where people go, oh, please come and playtest my game. Whereas if you're putting a new game out, everybody tends to put it out on one of a few different places. And then if you're going crowdfunding again, you only have like you're either going to Kickstarter or you're going to Indiegogo. So it's a lot easier uh, for me to find to find those games. How long has this been thing running and wh- where is it going? What are you doing with Indie RPG Pipeline? So it, it started back in 2015 and it started um, as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, I was doing this uh, i was preparing for the uh, for the 2015 what's hot in indie rpg seminar at dragon meet and so i posted in a in a g plus community in the indie plus community what games are people looking forward to in 2016 and um some people posted and said okay well i'm looking forward to this i'm looking forward to this other game and one person said how do you guys find out about these games hmm. and i wrote back to that guy and said Oh, are you not subscribed to the indie pipeline, which te- where you get every single month all the new games that are going to be coming out? And so <laughs> somebody wrote back and said, um, "I think you're probably joking, but that would be a really cool thing if it existed." And then my next post was like, "Okay, here it is. <laughs> Look, I've created it." And it started off in they say the end of 2015 as a G plus community, and that G plus community was. Basically, where I just any time I saw a new game being released that kind of came across my G plus feed, I would reshare it. And uh, I had like a whole bunch of different categories, and I was trying to track when things went into Kickstarter and when they got released and so forth. And then obviously, uh, 2018 comes around, so I was maintaining it for uh, for three years or so, and then we hear that it's G plus is going away. And I thought of all the stuff that I do in, in, in G+, and what of it do I actually want to save? And I had a real decision about, okay, well, do I want to keep going with, with this thing? And I put up a series of polls, basically to gauge the level of interest. Because if nobody replied to them, I'd be like, well, oh, well, forget about this. I mean, nobody cares about this anymore. Um, so there's no point in me kind of maintaining it. So after a series of polls, I kind of, I ended up going, okay, well, what does... What do people want me to continue? And the answer was was yes. Okay. Do, what do people actually value? Because how the format that it was going to turn into depended on what people actually cared about. And it turned out the thing that took me the most time <laughs> was actually the thing they cared about the least. So I was like, oh my god, three years <laughs> of <laughs> moving things in between different categories, saying, oh, it's going to be released in March. No, it's late again. I need to move it to release in April. And no one cares. Nobody cared about it. <laughs> And I ended up deciding on a on a blog, uh, partly inspired by by the by the the posts that are going around, which are trying to kind of resurface, like a you know a blogosphere, like after after G plus and kind of goes down. And uh, what happens now is that I've uh, I've instead of just uh, posting things that I I happen to see on my feed, um, like kind of going through my 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 G plus. Um, uh, my G plus feed is it, I now have a, a, an RSS reader and the RSS reader is plugged into everything new that comes on drive through RPG, oh. everything new that comes onto mm. Kickstarter, everything like every single blog that I can find, which might announce a new game. I get, uh, I, I have, um, I have it in my RSS reader and the RSS reader is set up in order that I can share from that reader directly into the blog, ah, which nice. is how I'm able okay. To maintain it because I have so little time 
at the moment that um, it has to be basically something that can fit into my commute <laughs> every morning. My my entire the only things that I can I can do kind of role playing game wise are things that can fit into the hour I spend in a bus on the morning or an hour I spend on the tube uh, in, in the evening. So there are obviously two main ways to support this. The first one is in case someone is creating an indie RPG, they can approach you and give you the details. And the other way around, if someone is interested in role-playing games in indie RPG, they can share this around, just like we ask people to share our podcast. If you like a thing, please do, please do share it, and then more people will know of the indie RPG pipeline and will be able to use it. Uh, is it also possible to support it monetary-wise with a Patreon or something? Yeah, so so talking about where the, the pipeline is going is, is really, it is something that I want to, to build as a piece of uh, infrastructure. So it is something that's supposed to be like, you know, the roads or the bridges or the sewers. So something that people use, but then people kind of make something out of it as opposed to... Um, so it helps other people achieve their goals as opposed to being a, a fully formatted and, and beautiful thing. Um, so people can definitely kind of plug uh, directly into it and see it all. But I would love if I, I, I love if, if people took it and then went, OK, well, here are the new games that have come out this month. Then then I want to talk about this particular one of it. Or I want to raise the awareness of these particular games that are coming out, and then use that as 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 a source of material that they can then use on in their blogs and their podcasts and and and, and so forth. So I, I really want to know from other people what how this pipeline can be made useful to them. And one of, one of the things that that I've that I've done myself, or at least I've helped organize. Is I was talking with um, with Lloyd Jan and um, and and James Mullen, and uh, they and I said that well, one of the reasons that I'm connecting with all these people through the Playmaker Awards is to find out well what do you need in order to do your job better? What can the, what can we do for you so that you can do things better? And <clears throat> and James asked me well. Well, what do you need? I'm like, okay, well, you know, I have this pipeline, but I am just essentially reading each of the entries in order to work out is it a new game or not? Because actually, eighty, ninety percent of the stuff that goes up through drive through is not a new game. It's a, it's yes. a scenario, yes. or it's an adventure, or it's a piece of stock art, or it's a random table, or, or whatever. So, but I'm still putting like sixty new games either crowdfunded or playtested or, or or newly released on there. And I, I, I don't have time to look into any of those games and I don't have the background and the experience to be able to go, okay, well, this game is, is significant because of the following reasons. So, or this is a game that actually you should take a second look at. And so I said, well, I need somebody basically to look at all the stuff I'm putting on the uh, the pipeline and tell me what of this stuff is actually worth a second look in in their opinion and so uh james and lloyd got together and they said <laughs> okay. well if you put it on the pipeline we will read it and then we will basically tell you we will put it we'll, we'll have a conversation like and just go through well here are the three games that stood out to us for for whatever reason and then we can do that as a podcast and so this is where this is, this, new, oh, okay. this is where the new podcast, uh, James and Lloyd read indie RPG blurb so you don't have to. Uh, nice. Na- name, is, name, is, name is provisional. <laughs> it works, it works. It also is very self-explanatory. I, I say the name is provisional, but I've done art for it now. You know, I've done a, hu- I've done, I've done a huge banner for it, so it's not that provisional anymore. And so... But obviously, as as the I want the pipeline to be useful, and I want it to kind of develop, and I want to develop, I want to find the people who are interested in who are just interested in it. And so, one of the things I'm doing with that, and and I will hopefully have kicked off by the time this is released, is a Patreon for the pipeline because obviously now we have this podcast on it. Then we're starting to incur you know real world costs. It's not just a yes. free blog that I put put up anymore. And I'm hoping that uh, as 
uh, if if that Patreon kind of finds support and it can pay for hosting fees, and then it can start, we can start looking to expand it to go. Okay, well, James and Lloyd look through uh, look through new games that are released. Well, what more do people? What more would people like? So and what I want what to f- more would people like other people to do for them? Yeah, <laughs> so they won't have to. And <laughs> and so. Hopefully, a patron will then start. People will start self-selecting. Is it if you are somebody who backs this patron for two dollars a month or whatever, then then I infer from that that you are a kind of person who is interested in new indie games that are being released, and therefore I want to hear from you as to what more you would want, or how we can change things, or what more things can we add? Can we add a new show like the James and Lloyd? Uh, the James and Lloyd show runs, you know, about, you know, I want to keep it about 10 minutes. Can we add another show, which is looking at a different aspect of it? Like maybe looking at the crowdfunding or can we add another show, which is a deep dive into one game that is just saying, this is the one mechanic that I am, that I'm, that I've been gripped by like this month. And Mm. can I then find the people to then create these shows as well? And then what about your opinion? What about, all your opinions about what is notable because James and Lloyd are just giving me what they think. And, you know, their point is, is and, and their opinion is, is, is just as valid as, 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 as yours or any other kind of, any other, any other backer, anybody else who, who's reading through it. So the idea behind the Patreon then is to then go, well, let us start trying to find the people who are interested in a contributing it to financially, but then also start thinking about, okay, well, can they contribute in providing a providing a, a a way forward for it, providing guidance in order to make it uh, better, both for them and for for other people out there? Excellent stuff. Um, cool. there, will, there will be links, of course, both to the Patreon, to the NDRPG pipeline, um, to, to the Playmaker, Playmaker Awards, Awards yeah. and to anything else that we've mentioned here on Dwarfcast.net and wherever it is that you are currently listening. There are show notes you can check there. Or you can just search for things like the Indie RPG Pipeline. It's not exactly a common search phrase, so that will be fine. Finally, let us return again just a bit for the Playmaker Award because it isn't actually done. There's a final part that you're going to start right now, right this February. What is it? What's going on? When I originally came up with the idea for the Playmaker Awards, I thought, well, get the nominations, I'll do... I'll send and then I'll announce the winners. I'll contact the winners, get their okay with it, and then I'll announce them and I'll send them send them their vouchers. But as I, especially as I started kind of going through it and started reading the nominations, I I got curious to go, okay, well, actually, I want to know more about these people. These nominations are just a tiny, tiny insight. I want to understand both who they are, uh, what they do, and and why they do it as well. I wanted a, a a a way of then having that conversation with these winners and then sharing that conversation with other people. And I could have done it as a, you know, as a podcast or something similar or a blog where I put up a, a series of interviews. But at that same time, Kickstarter said, we're going to run this zine quest initiative. So where you put a, um, where you basically, you, you create something, but it's going to be a very uh, low spec. You know, it's going to, yeah. we're going to insist that it's going to be like akin to the to the RPG zines of old. And it was happening at just the same time that I was thinking, I want to take this Playmaker Award thing further. And so hence I thought, okay, well, let's put together, a, let's, let's interview as many of these Playmaker winners as, as are willing to do it. Let me put together a zine, which is then a collection of, of these interviews with them and it will go into both who they are what they do what it takes from them what they get from it why they do it and then what they would want like both from the future or from you know the sky or, or what would what would help them kind of do their job better hmm. um and i've had um, you know, we we talked earlier about okay, well, who are the few, some of the people who have won this, and it has been I've got to say it's been a real range of people, um, it's so much more of a range than I could possibly have put together if I was just going, hmm, let me think of let me think of some of the people who who I think would deserve this award and then just send it to them. So we've got people 
from the UK scene. So Lloyd, I already mentioned. Uh, John Dodd, who is mm. an incredible legend. institution, a legend, yeah, yeah. In, in in UK convention, uh, UK convention role playing. Uh, several other people, um, kind of from the from the UK scene, including one guy who run things on Twitter, like who creates space for people to play primarily through a a, a Twitch uh, through a, a Twitch channel, which is something again I would never have heard of because I'm completely not plugged into that at all. And then you've got people from the US, so you have. Uh, Avanel Wing, who is the one of the key people behind um, behind Dexcon and Dreamation and Metatopia, and is just Ooh, wow. just doing a huge a huge amount. Of, I've already done my interview with her, and the, the amount of stuff that she does is she does is amazing. I mean, Sean Nittner, uh, who runs Big Bad, kind again. It was absolutely fascinating hearing how that convention uh, came about. Um, we also I'm also interviewing uh, Steve Segedy, who's the uh, the 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 managing director or something like that. He's like the co-owner of Bully Pulpit Games, along with Jason Morningstar, about his role helping organize games on demand. You know, the umbrella games on demand organization. And I had a conversation um, just a few days ago with Jason Cordova uh, of the Gauntlet, and which just, as far as host concerns, just kind of completely came out of nowhere, and then became this completely thriving happening online gaming space that yes, actually the, the seemed biggest, to work the biggest one that i know of I yeah think. yeah um so all these interviews with different people are all kind of going going to go uh into the zine and then hopefully other people will other people will, will read it hopefully they'll enjoy it they'll get a bit of insight into it they'll hope to kind of give these people the, the recognition they deserve but also hopefully they'll be inspired to go okay well actually maybe this is something that I can do as well. This is something that I can help with. So instead of just going, oh, the people we look up to, they're the games masters or they're the designers. And therefore, if I want to progress, you know, in, in this hobby, I, I want to become I a to games become master. One, yeah. or I want to become a, a designer. They can go, actually, there's this third path where I can become a playmaker, where I can create the space for other people to play. I really like the name Playmaker. And I really appreciate this thing that you're doing here. And I also must say that we are now nearing our end. So if there's one final thing you want to say, a summary, one would maybe call it, uh, this is the time <clears throat> to do it. From my perspective, certainly my corner of the role-playing hobby is at a point of inflection. You know, it is... Uh, with having our, our main platform taken away from us and there is no one obvious way that we're all going to go and we could potentially all go back to our own little islands and eventually it would work out because we would find some way of reconnecting with each other some, somehow, something would come along but we would lose so many people along the way so I would just say that the, the Indie RPG Pipeline and the Playmaker Awards are just my ways of trying to keep those connections alive kind of during this time. Wow. Thank you. That's, that's amazing. Just hearing someone picking up that challenge is, is amazing and uh, very, very inspiring as well. This has been us on the shoulders of dwarves. You can hear more of us on dwarfcast.net. You can send us email at show at dwarfcast.net. And you can also find us on the interwebs where we are all over the places. We are in the Twitter. We are in Facebook, but no longer in Google+. Plus. <laughs> you can search for Dwarf Podcast in, anywhere that, in any way, shape, or form. And there we will be. Also, not on MIUI. Thank you very much, Richard. For, well, thank you both, yeah. For coming and explaining and doing everything that you're doing. We shall not be doing taking the load of the thing because we're, yeah. we're uh, over time. Makes sense. Okay. okay. Yeah, the, yeah okay. The, the, only thing I'm, uh, the only thing I'm playing at the moment is a, uh, is a long-form uh, immersive LARP called Fatherhood. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I've, been, I've, been playing it, I've been playing it for two and a half years so far, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident enough in order to take, it up to, to take it up to the next level and add a second child. Wow. <laughs> You're like... You're like two levels above me. I'm, I'm, I've, I've been playing this game for almost two years now, right. and I, I don't know. I think uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with the, the current difficulty setting. <laughs> I, uh, I, I would say the in-game DLC is exorbitant. 
My God. <laughs> the cost. The cost. They, they just gouge you. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, then, we will now say goodbye each in our own native language. Ready? Three, two, one. Later. Later. Toodle pip. On the Shoulders of Dwarves is shared under Creative Commons by Attribution and Non Commercial 4. Intro and outro are by the Cliche Dio. And you can email us at show at dwarfcast.net. On the Shoulders of Dwarves.